So I've never used the you know name of the play outside of the confines of rehearsal. But Joel, uh, when he when he did his presentation to the to the cast and to the staff on the first day of rehearsal, he uh, he said you know I I wholeheartedly welcome the curse of this play because if we don't embrace the curse of this play, we can do this. Play. So with that, I welcome you to the Macbeth Insights. plays in the process for me usually comes when you're given the opportunity, and I say opportunity as opposed to challenge, of doing one of these, you know, epic plays with a smaller cast. Um, and far from being an exercise in economic thrift, I, I think they're a brilliant way of actually examining a story we think we know really well from slightly different perspectives. The process of adaptation, rather than being disrespectful to, you know, such a great artist, like Shakespeare, helps keep the work present and alive and always renewed in the culture. I think it's one of the reasons they have endured as long as they have. Otherwise, we would have long ago had the definitive production and we would have recorded it and there's no reason to do it. Um, <laughs> Duncan, I'm sure, was a potent king, but he only needs one son to really tell the story. So Don Wayne takes an accent. What I was more interested in doing you know, with this opportunity is to pick several of the characters that were most interesting to me and let them begin to absorb other language and give them some different subtext so that we're able to follow people on the journey along with Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. Because although we keep the drive, you know, the overarching um, kind of doomed rocket ship that is Macbeth's trajectory <laughs> through the show, what I was most interested in exploring with this group of actors is giving those other characters enough meat on the bone that they can follow along with him. Because as much as Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are making choices and dealing with the consequence of those choices, the other characters are acting on you know, their ambitions and have their own agency, and they need to have their conscience and their principles tested. So the, that scene <laughs> with Malcolm and Macduff, kind of, it lives with you more, I think, in this production, or I, I think it will. And by the end of the play, and with Malcolm's last speech that he gives, suddenly you're going to be thinking of the play a lot differently than a production you've seen before, or maybe a production you've, you know, you've just read the play and fell and fallen in love with it on the page. That I think something in this is going to be unlike the university. Yeah. Very often, people are inspired to, to cast an, an older sanitarium where they would treat tuberculosis, tuberculosis patients. And uh, utterly abandoned, really empty, and you could go there. And I'm not a believer in ghosts, but I do believe in um, maybe psychic recording, because you could go there and you could tell that um, fear and pain and sadness had been imprinted into the walls. And it was disturbing, too, because, of course, an abandoned space invites people who will you know, squat in it and conduct their own strange rituals. So there's bizarre graffiti, um, broken windows, and that experience kept coming back to me as I read the play, which is largely acknowledged to be one of the most sort of psychologically intense and harrowing uh, plays by Shakespeare. You know, he explores really extreme emotions among human beings who 
um, are motivated by desire and fear and ambition cope with the consequences to their conscience and their soul, I guess, for, their, for another term. And uh, it, it just seemed like the right space to house this production. Uh, uh, the question was, uh, Matt, how, how does he imagine Macbeth's humanity? If we've not done that, then you should run me out of town on a rail. Because I think that's like the one thing you have to do if you're going to do the play. Otherwise, you kind of have a Stations of the Cross <laughs> scenario about the comeuppance of a just bad apple. From scene to scene, how this man who has all the capacity for good and has lived an exemplary life and served his king with distinction and honor falls in, as he says later, in, like into the seer, you know, off the rails. He loses his moral compass. There are things he wants, and he wants them quicker than they may come, and he decides to help them along. It's not a play about evil forces that come and manipulate you. It's about perhaps something in yourself that draws toward you somebody or some force that will give you a temptation, that will give you a suggestion. And I think that's really interesting. So I think. Rather than a monster, it's, 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 it's watching a human being struggle in the most awful way. And I don't think you can absolve them of their actions, but you can understand that they were not, not making choices in the doing of their deeds. And whether those are bad choices, you know, I think it's pretty clear most of them are. But even a bad choice in the mind of the person making it, there is a rationalization that's going on. And that's interesting. And I think it interested Shakespeare, and I think that's why he wrote the play. 